It is therefore time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, uh, my question is for the Premier. 51,000 jobs. 51,000 jobs were lost in the month of January. That is the largest number of jobs lost in one month since 2009. This is proof that the economic policies of this government are reckless and unfair. This isn't change that works for families. It's actually hurting families. Mr. Speaker, what does the government say to the 51,000 families who lost their jobs last month? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to welcome everyone back and uh, add my congratulations to the member from Nipissing for being uh, appointed the uh, Leader of the Opposition and to thank him for that question. Thank you very much. Because, Mr. Speaker, I know that the Leader of the Opposition knows that Ontario's economy is growing. And, and Mr. Speaker, whenever there is a job loss in the province, the families that are affected, the, the individuals that are affected, Mr. Speaker, that is a very hard thing to deal with. I understand that, Mr. Speaker. But I know that the Leader of the Opposition understands that uh, the economy is growing and that, in fact, our unemployment rate is at a, a low, Mr. Speaker, a 17-year low. Low, and that Ontario has led the growth in G7 countries, Mr. Speaker. We have outstripped the growth across the, across the country, Mr. Speaker. Yes, and I recognize that even though all of that is happening, Mr. Speaker, there are still people who are not sharing in that growth. And I'll speak to that in the okay. supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Premier. Years of Liberal policy have led to the worst month for jobs since this Premier took office. The FAO pointed out entire regions of the province were being unfairly left behind last year. Southwestern, Eastern and Northern Ontario saw only 1,600 jobs combined. And just look at what economist Philip Cross had to say about these newest numbers. The January drop shows that gushing reports about a booming economy were wildly overstated. He added the underpinnings to the Ontario economy have looked increasingly shaky for some time. But this government will cherry-pick statistics and tell everyone that everything is rosy. Question. Mr. Speaker, everything isn't rosy. Stop. I haven't forgotten what I've been doing before we left. Finish, please. Thank you, Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, everything isn't rosy. Will the Premier admit that the cumulative impact Question. of her government policy is costing hard-working Ontarian their jobs, and that's just not fair? Well, Mr. Speaker. I agree with the Leader uh, of the Opposition that we have to look at the whole picture, but yeah, we absolutely. do have to look at the whole picture. So we yeah. have to look at the fact that since the recession, Mr. Speaker, 800,000 right. new jobs have been created in this province. We have to recognize that since I've been Premier, 400,000 new jobs have been created in this province. Having said that, having said that, we're seeing that growth, but it is not being shared evenly, Mr. Speaker, which is exactly why free tuition, OHIP Plus, Mr. Speaker, an Thanks increase in the minimum wage to $15 an hour, which unfortunately decline. all of the leadership candidates in the, uh, in the race on the, uh, for the Conservatives have, have said they don't support, Mr. Speaker. But those, those initiatives that support people, that Remember actually from the help Carlton people to deal with global uncertainty, Mr. Speaker, those are the things that we are putting in place because we're actually fighting for the people of Ontario, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. The Liberals have been warned by experts that their too fast, too soon anti business policies would put people out of work. The Premier was warned, warned again, warned again, and warned again. Yet she ignored the warnings for purely political purposes. Though numbers are staggering, youth lost jobs at a rate six and a half times higher than the rest of the population. Women saw their employment drop four times the rate of Ontario's men. Single moms and children trying to earn a living have been targeted by this Liberal government's too fast, 
too soon anti-business, anti-job policy. Mr. Speaker, can the Liberals explain how this is possibly fair for Ontario? So, Mr. Speaker, what I hear the Leader of the Opposition say when he says too fast, too soon, the subscript to that is the minimum wage increase, yeah, Mr. Speaker. Right. And what I hear yeah, him say saying. is not now, not ever, Mr. Remember Speaker. From Duffin yeah. Duffin yeah. Exactly yeah. what I hear him say. About, Mr. Speaker, the people who are cleaning our institutions, Mr. Speaker, the people who are serving us, Mr. Speaker, in all of the businesses across this province, if those people had continued to earn $11.60 an hour, they had to go to the food bank at the end of the month, Mr. Speaker. That is, that is the reality that the Leader of the Opposition is supporting when he says, not now, not ever. We believe that in a province as wealthy as Ontario, in a The member from Renfrew come to order. Finish, please. In a province as wealthy as Ontario, where there are so many people who are doing so well, Mr. Speaker, and corporate uh, profits are at an all-time high, it is time, Mr. Speaker, that we make sure that people have what they need to look after their families. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you see it, please? You see it, please? New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question again is for the Premier. We heard a common theme at almost every meeting of the pre-budget consultations throughout Ontario last month. We heard that this government is not doing enough for mental health treatment. The words of a 17-year-old student in Sudbury left a lasting impression on me and all of us at that committee. Uh, he said, quote, I attempted suicide. I am extremely fortunate to be here today. I felt utterly alone. He told the committee that, quote, most youth are unsure of what to do and where to go when they're faced with depression and low mental wellness. They don't know of resources available to them, and sometimes they can't even access these resources. Mr. Speaker, why has this government failed Question. to provide resources for mental health are you so desperately need? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Children and Youth Services is going to want to follow up. But, Mr. Speaker, let me just say to uh, the Leader of the Opposition, but to the Legislature and the people of Ontario, we recognize that there is more that needs to be done. We have been making huge investments. I just, I just returned from a, a campus tour, Mr. Speaker. I went across, around the province, visiting college and university campuses. And at every single stop, and a, and a high school stop, Mr. Speaker, at every stop, the issue of mental health came up. And I think that is a very good thing in the sense that, Mr. Speaker, people are talking about it. And I said to these young people, you know, 35 years ago, we wouldn't be having this conversation. You would not be raising this issue because it was not uh, there was not the awareness that there is, Mr. Speaker, now. And we have put resources into school boards, we have put resources on campuses, but I am the first to agree, Mr. Speaker, that there is more that we need to do to make sure that there's coordination of services, to make sure that there are more services in terms of counselling and uh, professionals. We're setting up youth hubs, yes, Mr. Speaker, so that there's an interdisciplinary model, but there is more to be done, and we are going to make those investments, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Another youth advocate told our committee about his battle with mental health. He said his battle with depression, quote, that took me down a really dark road for about eight months. I couldn't handle the pain anymore, and I tried to take my own life. But he added, he's here in front of you today to talk to you about a broken system. He went on to say, not just a broken system that almost claimed my life, but a broken system that has and will continue to take more lives if we don't start acting now. He was so brave to come forward to this committee. They are very poignant words, Speaker, from a very strong individual. We cannot and we must not let his words ring hollow. Question. The government must act. Mr. Speaker, how much longer will this government accept this broken system? Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to take a moment to thank the member opposite for the question. 
Um, we've gone around the province, uh, many members in our caucus here and the Minister of Health, to speak to young people. And we're aware that there's more work that needs to be done when it comes to helping young people with mental health challenges. You know, and as a as a government, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've continuously invested money into mental health since 2008. In fact, uh, 10 billion dollars more since 2008. And uh, Minister Hoskins and myself and this government and our premier has have said, and we've made a commitment that we will increase funding to mental health here in the province of Ontario. The, uh, the party opposite says that they'll invest $1.9 billion over 10 years. It's simply not enough. And it's not just about the money, Mr. Speaker. It's about changing the system. And that's Order. why we've uh, dedicated a lot of time and energy to moving on mental health, which is a new uh, system we're putting in place, Answer. where we're putting in lead agencies right across the province to better coordinate services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member from Middlesex, London, will come to order. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. There were so many courageous individuals who shared their stories and their fight with our committee. However, maybe the most impactful story was about one individual who couldn't share that day. A London healthcare worker said he has witnessed some pretty tragic instances. He shared this very uh, disheartening story. Quote, we had people turned away from the doors in urgent care department at St. Joe's. Quote, one of those poor souls committed suicide in the parking lot. No services, no psychiatric services that can be attained in a timely manner. This is unacceptable. Quote, that's what we heard at the committee. Mr. Speaker, this is unacceptable. No matter the, any numbers that we're hearing from the Liberals, Question. whatever dollar amount they claim to invest is simply not enough. Why are the resources to support these struggling with mental health not Thank available? You. Minister. Uh, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, this is such an important issue, and I do want to commend the me member opposite for raising not only the issue but two very real examples of that demonstrate the work that still needs to be done. Mr. Speaker, we, all of us here in this legislature, are so committed to improving mental health in this province. I think all of us understand that mental health and physical health are two sides of the same coin. We need to demonstrate that same vigor and intent and determination on mental health as we do in providing the health services for those with physical ailments. And this government, Mr. Speaker, over the past number of years has been every single year increasing those investments and, in fact, doing some things unprecedented in this country. Uh, Introducing structured psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. We're the first province in the country to do that. Uh, we're creating a network of youth wellness hubs. Every hospital around this province has, and this was done together with the Answer. OHA, a suicide prevention plan and a plan to address uh, the uh, tragic uh, circumstances of individuals who Thank are you. in that difficult circumstance, Mr. Speaker. There's a lot more work to be done. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Premier. On January 14th, Toronto East uh, Hospital had 161 patients in its medical unit, but only 135 funded beds. That's a 119 per cent occupancy rate. Now, the Premier knows that experts consider a safe occupancy rate for hospitals to be 85 per cent. Clearly, the Premier's temporary funding is not solving the hospital overcrowding and hallway medicine crisis that has been decades in the making in this province. When will this Premier acknowledge the damage that she and her Liberal Party have been doing to our hospitals? Thank you. thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the leader of the third party for uh, for the question. And, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that uh, that our hospitals are facing uh, increased capacity demands, Mr. Speaker. It's exactly why uh, we've increased the capacity across the uh, continuum of care by adding 1,200 additional beds, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care will want to speak to the to those beds and how how those resources are going to continue to be able to uh, be available to our hospitals. 
hospitals. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, having said that, we recognize that uh, there is more that needs to be done, and we uh, we increased hospital budgets, Mr. Speaker, Answer. by 500 million dollars in the last budget. We recognize that uh, with this particular influx of uh, of need, that there's more that needs to be done, and we will continue to Thank work you. to support hospitals across the province. Speaker, in January, the Scarborough Hospital's Birchmount site reached an alarmingly high occupancy rate of 147 per cent. The hospital actually had 25 fewer beds to tend to patients than at this time last year. Speaker. Why is this Premier still ignoring the crisis that we have in our hospital system? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, first of all, I want to uh, uh, acknowledge and recognize our frontline health care workers and the health care leadership across this province who have been doing an absolutely exceptional job in the face of what we commonly, regularly see during these months, not only flu but other respiratory illnesses. And it has been a particularly bad year. We know that uh, both here in Ontario, across Canada, across North America. Mr. Speaker, the reference that was made to Toronto East Health Network, the Michael Guerin Hospital, uh, in fact, their uh, uh, occupancy uh, in uh, pardon me, Mr. Speaker. In October, it was 83 per cent. In November, it was 84 per cent. In December, it was 83 per cent. In January, Mr. Speaker, it was 88 per cent. And that in the face of a very bad flu and respiratory season that fortunately mr speaker we're over the top of that curve with flu at least with influenza a but mr speaker part of the reason i think our hospitals Answer. have been able to accommodate these pressures are is the 1200 additional beds the equivalent of six community hospitals that we announced last thank time. you final supplementary Speaker, the crisis in our hospitals has been in the making for quite some time, right. and the, the responsibility lays at the feet of this government that's been in office for 15 years. 15 years, Speaker. The problem in our hospital system didn't start with the flu season, and you can ask any ex expert in the hospital system and they'll tell you. They have been in crisis for years now. That's why the Ontario Hospital Association has been begging this government to properly fund our hospital systems, and they have ignored them time and time again. The last Conservative government, they closed 28 hospitals, Speaker, no. and they laid off 6,000 nurses. The Premier has continued down a path of cuts of and budget freezes in our hospitals. Staying on gurneys and makeshift spaces like, ho like hospital hallways uh, and, and waiting rooms is not the place that Ontario should be, but it is now the Question. norm for patients in Ontario. Why is the Premier okay with that, Speaker? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, so not only did we add the equivalent of six community hospitals, 1,200 acute care beds last fall through this uh, winter season uh, to the end of the fiscal year, Mr. Speaker, but we just also recently announced e an even more funds the upcoming fiscal year. I think it's just under $200 million, a new investment to maintain many of those beds that were opened up, but also to work closely with the Ontario Hospital Association and all of those hospitals uh, so we allocate them so they make the greatest possible impact. But I'd be remiss, Mr. Speaker, if I, and I know the uh, leader of the third party referenced the PCs closing. I think they said 10,000. 10,000 hospital beds? 9,600, Mr. Speaker, was the NDP record. So they, they closed, I think it was 13 per cent of the mental health beds in this province and almost a quarter of all the acute care beds. So I can only imagine if they were in power with their commitment to find $600 million in cuts, it would be a desperate situation right now. No question. The leader of the uh, thank you, Speaker. My next question is for the Premier. But I'm glad the Minister of Health talked about the Liberal that was in charge at the time. Um, the Premier and the Conservative Party, Speaker, are in lockstep when it comes to underfunding our hospitals as well. They also agree that selling off pieces of Hydro One and our hydro system is the right thing to do. But the Financial Accountability Officer, in fact, disagrees. Just last week, the Financial Accountability Officer said that the sell-off of Hydro One will be costing Ontario families nearly $300 million a year. 
Now, doesn't the Premier think that $300 million a year would be better off in the hands of Ontario fan families funding things, Speaker, like hospitals and schools? Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I appreciate the question, recognizing the importance for us to ensure that uh, we continue to support our companies so that they can outperform in the marketplace. And certainly, the way Hydro was being um, acted upon, and it wasn't providing the, the proper receipts and the proper revenues and the proper controls and the mechanisms. And now we got much more discipline in the operation. We still own over 44% of the company. Wow. It still provides tremendous amounts of revenues to the province, and more importantly, it paid down some needed debt in the system. Yep. And of course, we now have proceeds to the tune of five billion dollars over and going further up as we put in the trillium trust to invest in new opportunities to provide even greater revenues and greater opportunities for the people of ontario we'll continue to invest where we can produce more value and help the people of ontario mr speaker thank you supplementary Speaker, the Premier said she sold off Hydro One to fund her many infrastructure promises, but the FAO says that the funding of infrastructure in this way will actually cost Ontarians $1.8 billion more than had the government simply financed those projects themselves. So can the Premier tell Ontarians who exactly benefits from the $1.8 billion of Liberal overspending this time? Thank you, Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I appreciate the, the reports that are made by our independent agents, but they also uh, don't mention, and they should, in regards to what is being invested and what are the receipts coming back to the province as a result. As you know, uh, during uh, that transaction, we have now paid down debt by $5.1 billion. We have over $6.2 billion in the Trillion Trust to engage and to invest. Uh, and furthermore, the actions of the operations are now enhanced, providing even greater value for the shareholders, which are the province of Ontario and the people of Ontario. But going forward, we're going to continue to invest. We know that the investments we make in roads, bridges, schools, and hospitals bring back seven times more value than what was initially invested. That, too, is critical to people of Ontario. And furthermore, the opposition make it sound as though we're selling off Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, we're talking about transmission, and that is all we're doing. We recognize the operation of the, uh, of the power generation still continues to be held by a public purse and will continue to support those initiatives for the benefit of all people of Thank Ontario. You. Stop the clock. Final supplementary. The Premier's wrong-headed decision to sell off Hydro One means billions of dollars, billions of dollars less for the services that matter the most for families. Revenue from Hydro One should be going directly into patient care in overcrowded hospitals not, and into our children's classroom speaker. But the Liberals and Conservatives won't bring Hydro One back into public hands. How can this Premier continue to defend the wrong-headed and financially damaging decision to sell off Hydro One? Thank you. Minister of Energy, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, our goal, is, uh, as we've always said, Mr. Speaker, is to get the best possible value for the people of Ontario and invest billions in transit, transportation and infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, through the Trillium Trust. That includes Go Regional Express, LRT projects in multiple communities and the Ring of Fire in the North, Mr. Speaker, just to name a few. Looking at the FBO's report, it confirms that as a publicly traded company, Hydro One is in a, a position to achieve efficiencies that will create savings for Ontario ratepayers and a boost to the province's revenues, Mr. Speaker. The NDP's biggest idea is to buy back shares of Hydro One at a cost of billions of dollars using money that would otherwise go to funding hospitals and schools, Mr. Speaker. Maybe they can explain what schools they will close, how many nurses they will fire once again, Mr. Speaker. The worst part is that won't even take one cent off of any bill, Mr. Speaker. Answer. It is this government that brought forward the Fair Hydro Plan, taking 25 per cent off everyone's bills across the province and building infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. New question. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, last month, the uh, London Health Science Centre announced that the Cardiac Fitness Institute will close this spring. 
was established in 1981, the CFI provides rehabilitation and fitness education for patients who have suffered from serious heart problems. It serves roughly 1,600 people a year. It only costs about $150,000, and the hospital cited the reason for its closure as a funding environment that has become increasingly challenging, resulting in their inability to fund the program further. You need to look no further than to see how this government has damaged our health care system in Ontario. Speaker, my question is to the minister. Do you agree with removing this important service from serious cardiac health care? Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Health, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, of course, uh, fundamentally, our government is absolutely committed to ensuring that Ontarians receive the highest quality evidence-based care. And we know, uh, uh, and I understand, and we're monitoring closely, that the London Health Sciences Centre has taken a de decision, uh, a decision that is based uh, on, uh, as they say, uh, uh, the best evidence with regards to post-cardiac incident care. Uh, and they've made a decision that as of the end of March, they will no longer be accepting at that particular site, uh, will no longer be a, a, a accepting uh, cardiac patients that have had a cardiac event. But Mr. Speaker, uh, despite making that decision to end further patient referrals, referrals which amounted to uh, under 10 per month, uh, that we're confident, and London Health Sciences uh, is currently working with St. Joe's, Answer. that the patients currently going to uh, London Health Sciences will uh, continue to receive their full evidence-based cardiac re rehabilitation care through that program at St. Joseph's in London, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, though, though, uh, back to the minister, the St. Joe's program kicks the patients out after six months, uh, which really doesn't rely on the, the information that's available from Britain, which shows uh, the advantage of continuing this program at LHSC. Mr. Speaker, through underfunding over the years, this government has caused many programs throughout the system to become defunct. Through years of their failed uh, funding of the hospital system, patients aren't getting the resources they need. Backed by scientific evidence, the preventative care provided by the CFI is shown to both reduce the number of readmittance due to heart problems, as well as saving the health care millions of dollars. These services are available in Windsor, Toronto and Ottawa, but no longer in London after March. Speaker, will the minister, considering how low cost this program is, how many lives it positively impacts, will the minister commit to funding this program here, here. further? But Mr. Speaker, I know as a fellow health care professional, the member opposite appreciates and I would hope agrees that we need to allow our frontline health care providers, our physicians, uh, the entire complement to make the best decisions based on evidence and quality of care. And in fact, after March 18th, all of those patients enrolled in London through their cardiac rehab uh, program will continue to receive as they do in the entire rest of the province, six months of post-cardiac care. I don't know if the member opposite is suggesting that we should create a system which is unbalanced, inequitable for a small minority, which runs contrary to the best evidence that exists. And the evidence, by the way, endorsed by Cardiac Care Ontario and present through the entire cardiac system in this province. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question for the Minister of Housing. Housing and rental sorry. Housing and rental costs in Toronto have reached a tipping point. Families are being priced out of their neighborhoods, and many have lost hope that they'll be able to raise their children in the communities that they know and they, they love. Premier Wynne had the opportunity to ease this affordable housing crisis with inclusionary zoning and set aside an adequate number of residential developments to become affordable housing. But instead, the Premier decided to cap the number of affordable units to just 5 per cent, compared to the 30 per cent recommended by experts. Will the minister reverse this short-sighted developer-friendly cap and instead strengthen inclusionary zoning to help people put a roof over their head. Thank you. Minister of Housing, responsible for Thank you, Mr. Reduction. Speaker. I want to thank the member for the question. Under our Fair Housing Plan, we've taken a number of steps to make housing more affordable for Ontarians, whether it's increasing the rebate uh, for first-time home buyers on uh, the land transfer tax, extending rent control to all Ontario tenants, uh, capping uh, ability of landlords to evict tenants uh, 
uh, when they're simply pretending to use it for their own use, and most recently introducing a standard lease. We're making important steps to improve the affordability of housing. On inclusionary zoning, we released a framework for consultation with Ontario municipalities and all stakeholders. I'm uh, having ongoing discussions with stakeholders on a daily basis on how uh, to implement that at a local level, which is where it will be implemented by municipalities, to create thousands of new Answer. affordable units across this province, Mr. Good. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, again to the minister. Speaker, these are just empty words from the minister. His actions, the actions of his premier, time and again show where the priorities lie. They, show, they lie with big banks, with big developers, with big business. Only New Democrats are committed to strengthening inclusionary zoning and repairing our crumbling social housing units. <laughs> Toronto families need action on affordable housing, and they need it now not more developer-friendly regulations from a government that continues to let them down. Will the minister commit to remove the cap on affordable housing units now so that Toronto families can have an affordable place to live? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We put forward a framework for consultation. As part of that consultation, we're getting excellent feedback from municipalities and other stakeholders. We're in fact, it's not a cap of 5% even in the draft. It was up to 10%, uh, Mr. Speaker. But we are looking at the rate of set-aside to increase that. We're looking at how uh, uh, development could be incented. And the purpose of inclusionary zoning is to create more housing and ensure that that additional housing supply is affordable. And, Mr. Speaker, I put that forward as a private member's bill. I've taken the mandate from uh, Premier Wynne on this, and Mr. Speaker, we will deliver an inclusionary zoning framework that's going to create thousands and tens of thousands of affordable units across this province. Thank you. The question, the member from DGZ Short. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Uh, speaker, as we ushered in the new year, we also entered a new area of workplaces in Beaches, East York, and across the province. January 1st was a day for our working people and those across the province because over the number of years that I've served, I've spoken with countless families about how the nature of their work has changed in the province. And these families are working hard to put food on the table and take care of their children. But they often find that the money runs out before the month is over. And while the opinion, this opinion may not be shared with all members opposite, I firmly believe that everyone who works 35, 40 hours a week shouldn't have to struggle to get by. And that's why I'm so pleased, Speaker, that our government has made such prolific changes to our workplace laws. This includes, of course, an increase to the minimum wage, taking it to a living wage of 14 this year and 15 next year. So, Speaker, Question. can the minister please inform the House about these changes and what employees and employers can expect as a result? Thank you, Minister of Labour. Speaker, thank you very much to the member from Beaches East York for this excellent question. The very conversations question. that he outlined in his question that he's had in his own community echo what we've all heard across the province over the past two or three years. We embarked on a very extensive, a comprehensive review of employment laws, and we realized that changes needed to be made to bring those laws up to date to 2018, Speaker. That's why we move forward with the plan. We made changes so that employees in the province of Ontario will see an increase to the minimum wage, two paid personal emergency leave days, increased vacation, Speaker, equal pay for equal work, and for those going through the living hell of domestic and sexual violence, won't have to worry about their jobs while they're dealing with that situation, Speaker. We didn't have support from everybody in this House, Speaker, but I'm so proud that on this side of the House, we're on the side of Ontario workers. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I would like to personally thank the Minister of Labour, not only for his answer, but for his very progressive advocacy on this file. 
We know, Speaker, we know that the, the province is doing, the economy is doing very well. We have led the G7 in economic growth for the past three years. And since the recession, Speaker, we've created almost 800,000 new jobs. And our unemployment rate has been the lower than the national average for the last 34 months and now stands at a record low of hovering around 5.5 per cent, Speaker. So our businesses are expanding and creating wealth. And I believe that everyone deserves to share in that prosperity. And yet, those who, there are those across the hall who believe it's still not time for these changes. They keep saying that this is too much too soon. Is $15 really too much, Speaker? They believe that the working people in this province should wait, although they won't say for how long. And I know that the families of Beaches East York can't wait. They Question. want these changes now. So, Speaker, will the minister please explain how his plan will create Ontario's and give 50 minimum wage for all thank you. workers? Minister Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for that excellent supplementary, Speaker. Speaker, it's very simple. We increased the minimum wage on January 1st of this year, $14 an hour. January 1st, 2019, Speaker, it goes to $15 an hour. Speaker, anybody that tells you any different, anybody that tries to delay that, Speaker, is simply denying that to the people Nine. in the province of Ontario. Any attempt to roll back, cancel the increase to $15 an hour, Speaker, takes money away from Ontario workers. And speaker, that's Real important goods. money. That's money they rely on for food, for rent, for transit, for buying clothes for the kids, Speaker. Sorry. I don't think that it's fair. I don't think it's right. Sorry. Ontarians can't afford to wait any longer, Speaker. We phased the plan in over 18 months. More workers are benefiting now, more fairly, Speaker, from Ontario's incredible economic growth. Answer. Free tuition, rent control, Speaker. We're standing up for Ontario workers. We've got their backs. We're not backing down from that commitment, Speaker. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question. The member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Thanks, uh, Speaker. To the uh, Minister of Transportation. Speaker, as the opposition transport critic, I want to welcome the member for Cambridge to her new role as Minister of Transportation. But now, now let's uh, let's get down to business, Speaker. Would the minister tell me why? She used her first opportunity as minister to go back to the old Liberal playbook and hand out another high-speed rail patronage appointment to former Liberal Minister David Cullinan. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you very much to the member opposite and my critic in this role, another member from Waterloo Region. Thank you very much for the question this morning. High-speed rail is incredibly important to the economy of Ontario. We're delighted to have uh, David Collinet, with all of his expertise, to now be the chair of our new panel advisory committee while we continue to uh, do some of the preliminary work in order to deliver this incredibly important role. While preparing the preliminary business case, special advisor at that point, David Collinet, met with many different stakeholders, including Indigenous communities, to make sure that the business case was solid for high speed rail. We have affirmed that there's an a, a really great business case. The high-speed rail will have an immense impact on Ontario's economy. It will be continuing to uh, be built in the coming weeks and months. We will be continuing to uh, provide an initial $15 million in a comprehensive environmental assessment to finally get some of the route started in this very important project. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, I uh, suppose you all still agree that he is still entitled to those entitlements. Speaker, this is electioneering at its worst. It's the second election in a row that the Wynn Liberals have attempted to lure voters with high-speed dreams at, of course, at taxpayers' expense. Last election, they had a UK consultant slap together a report based on Google Maps. Four years later, they're back at it again. Another taxpayer-subsidized appointment for their old pal David Colonnette as high-speed rail chair. In fact, the same David Colonnette who just left his previous liberally appointed role as high-speed rail advisor. Speaker, as the government spins its wheels, will the minister admit this liberal high-speed rail sequel is just another taxpayer-funded desperate attempt to hold or cling to power? Thank you very much, Speaker. And in his new role, we know that Minister, Mr. Collinet will continue to provide 
The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, second time. Finish, please. Thank you. We know he'll continue to provide excellent strategic advice moving forward on this landmark project. We need his experience to move forward, and his skills would be uh, uh, very helpful uh, to see this project through. What I would point out is that the member opposite has made sure that any idea, any time he has the ability to vote on our <coughs> government budget that uh, provides the investments needed to bring a project forward, he has consistently, with his party, voted against these, these investments. So let me be clear. I don't believe that his party would ever support a high-speed rail Answer. or provide some of the uh, infrastructure money in order to move forward with an important project like this. It takes longer than four years to do it. Thank you. Your question, the member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour le ministre de la Santé. Des... My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Ninety-one-year-old Godfrey Alder and his 88-year-old wife Hildegard of Sudbury. They have been separated since August of 2017. Last week was their first ever Valentine's Day apart in 67 years of marriage. Now that they need long-term care, they've been separated by a system that doesn't care about keeping couples together and by a government that won't fix it. Hildegard and Godfrey miss each other every day. The minister says that spousal reunification is a top priority, but it has been six months and nothing has happened. Why won't this Liberal government stop the forced separation of couples needing long-term care and reunite Hildegard and Godfrey today? Thank you. Minister of Health, long-term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, first of all, I want to uh, um, affirm and express uh, my concern with regards to this couple, but any couple across this province that, uh, for whatever reason, uh, but particularly when it comes to long-term home placements, where they're unable to uh, receive and obtain those placements together. I, I find it unimaginable. I can't imagine the stress that they're going through. And, Mr. Speaker, that's why I'm so grateful that the member opposite has raised this today, because, in fact, today, the changes that we made in the legislation last fall, which creates a separate category for spousal reunification and requires long-term care homes to set aside specific dedicated beds for spousal reunification, that legislation and those regulations actually Answer. take place and now are in place as of today, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker. The minister knows full well that crisis will always take priority, and the crisis list in Sudbury will never end. They will never be together. This 91-year-old man and his 88-year-old wife lie alone, crying at night. Consider the stress for those two elderly people. Their health is declining. Their mental health suffer. They just want to be together. The minister says that spousal reunification and long-term care is a top priority, but clearly it is not, because Hildegard and Guffrey have been forced to live apart for six long months. When you're 91 years old, six months is a long time, Speaker. When will this Liberal government stop making excuses and say, do what they say that they will do? Get Question. Hildegard and Guffrey back together. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, we did what we say, said we would do. Mr. Speaker, last fall, perhaps the member wasn't focused on the legislation, but it created outside of crisis. This has nothing to do with crisis, uh, as opposed to what the member is trying to suggest. Every single long-term care home in this province, for the first time in history, as of today, is required to set aside specific dedicated beds for spousal reunification. So I'm hopeful, and I would hope that the member, I would hope for the first time, the member would work together with me, as some of her colleagues have, on this specific case to see if they can now take advantage of a system of a, of a law and regulations specifically set up to aid in this very challenging That's situation. Great. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, we have an opportunity here. This has nothing to do with crisis designation. Answer. This has to do in response to many, many stakeholders and families coming forward and us finding a way to create a better system. Thank you. Any questions? The member from the Merci, Monsieur le Président. My question. No. My question is for the Minister of the Environment. 
Chris Bandlud. Governments are concerned and want to see real action on climate change, and that's why we've taken the initiative to reduce greenhouse gas emissions substantially. In 2014, we shut down dirty coal-fired plants, reducing nearly one quarter of the sulfur dioxide emissions in the province. And I can attest in a professional capacity about the health benefits of that particular initiative. In 2016, we can implement our climate change action plan that includes our best-in-class cap-and-trade program. Last month, the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario recognized we've exceeded our 2014 greenhouse gas reduction goals and we're on track to meet our 2020 goal. My question is this, Speaker. Can the minister please further explain what our government is doing to address climate change while making life more affordable for the province of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member uh, from Etobicoke North for that important question. And, and being a, a medical practitioner, like the government of Ontario, you know, uh, he recognizes how critical it is that Ontario tackles climate change head on, Mr. Speaker. We don't take that responsibility lightly. That's why we're limiting the amount of greenhouse gas pollution businesses can emit each year, and we're reducing that cap each year, Mr. Speaker. And that's not all. Speaker, last year our cap and trade auctions generated $1.9 billion in proceeds. <laughs> and we're reinvesting every dollar of those proceeds into green programs that are helping Ontario businesses, Ontario homeowners to <clears throat> fight climate change and save money, Mr. Speaker. These investments include hundreds Answer. of thousands of dollars for bike lanes, energy retrofits for homes, hospitals, social housing. I'd like to make one thank thing clear, Speaker. All of these. You, you can do that at the supplementary. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And, uh, Minister, I'd like to thank you on behalf of everyone who breathes in the province of Ontario. Speaker, climate change should no longer be seen as a question, a supposition, or a speculation. On this side of the House, the governing side, we know that climate change is a reality that we can't overlook. We have to face climate change with real solutions and affordable, at affordable cost. And that's why we've implemented a cap and trade program that is recognized by third party experts as the most effective way to reduce emissions. Speaker, in addition to promising to scrap our cap and trade program, the current but fluctuating roster of PC leadership candidates would axe the carbon tax, which is the funding basis of their entire platform, which blows Speaker a $9 billion plus hole in their platform. And that's just this week. Question. It's clear the party opposite doesn't take climate change and protecting our environment seriously. Speaker, can the minister Thank please you. explain? Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker. You know, it's obvious the PCs refuse to take fighting climate change and protecting our environment seriously. Let's not forget, Speaker, that it, this is the party that voted against our Climate Action Plan, the Green Belt Act, and the Great Lakes Protection Act, Mr. Speaker. But what's unclear is how they plan to fund their platform promises without money from their carbon tax scheme. Okay. Speaker, this means that in order to fund what they promised in their glossy magazine, they'll have to make billions of dollars in cuts. We can be certain that if elected, the PCs would be making billions of dollars of cuts in critical social programs that Ontarians rely on. Speaker, right. things like OHIP Plus, things like free tuition, and the $15 minimum wage. Meanwhile, Answer. Speaker, our government is investing in Ontarians by funding programs that make it easy and affordable for them to make greener choices. Yeah, yeah. No question. A member from Perth West. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs about his job loss policy. Last week, the minister let the horse out of the barn. He revealed that the OLG will be sh shutting down Ajax Casino, threatening the future of horse racing in Ajax Downs. This news caught the town of Ajax totally by surprise. The minister left them to read about it in the Peterborough newspaper. The mayor of Ajax, Steve Parrish, put out a statement saying, I think this government has been caught red-handed in their deception. It is amazing how far they will go to cover up their backroom deal. Stop the clock. 
the member will withdraw. He knows he cannot say indirectly what he cannot say directly. Withdraw. 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 Finish your question. Speaker, uh, to the minister, why are you putting 1,700 jobs in rural Ontario in jeopardy with a secret deal to shut down HS Casino? That's what they do. Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. The member opposite is asking a question knowing fully well that no decision has been made. We say that we've issued offer a release to, to, to comment on the fact that a fairness monitor is involved to maintain fairness and transparency throughout the entire process. The member opposite also knows that the candidate running in that riding is also the former head of the OLG. No matter where he sits, the member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound will come to order. Carry on. Who himself had initiated this modernization process to remove slots from some of these racetracks. We on this side of the House have been committed and will continue to commit to support racing in our province. We have a procurement process that must be followed appropriately, but we also have an agreement with the racing community to ensure we provide support for these racetracks and the horsemen especially so that they can plan their breeding cycle on an ongoing basis. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Perhaps the finance minister didn't read the Peterborough newspaper. Back to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, the sudden move to shut down the slots at Ajax Downs is the latest example of this government's reckless approach to horse racing and rural affairs. We already know the Liberals secretly plan to kill the slots at racetrack program, fully aware it would collapse the industry. Now we discover that the government has apparently cut a secret deal that will likely destroy quarter horse racing in the province. Speaker, that minister is big on talk, but his actions show a real lack of respect for rural communities. My question, will the government support the town of Ajax's call for an independent, fair public review of the decision? Yes or no? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, absolutely we will maintain fairness and transparency. We said that from the start. But that member opposite and that party voted against the measures to provide full and, and accurate and sustainable funding for the horse racing industry. We're putting that in place, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. The member opposite can't say we're not. We're providing those very opportunities, very dollars that the horse racing community requires. And that member opposite also knows that his candidate, who's, who's running in that party, is the man that masterminded this process from the beginning. We will do what's necessary to support. Joe Dixon, the member of that of that riding, has been fighting hard and advocating. You see it, please. New question. Member from Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, water is a fundamental element of life. Without water, nothing survives. Rural residents have been able to draw clean well water for their families and for their farms for over 100 years in southwestern Ontario. However, there are wells contaminated in Chatham-Kent with sediments that the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change refuses to collect and analyze. Residents suspect that this is as a result of pile driving through the aquifer uh, that has released sediments. The local residents collected and analyzed the sediments and found them to contain black shale which is known as an environmental hazard because it contains heavy metals. Last week, the Premier held a town hall meeting in Windsor, saw the black shale contained uh, water like black like coffee, and told the residents that it was safe to drink without the benefit of a health hazard investigation. Will the Premier back up her claim and direct the Mr. Minister of the Environment to collect and analyze these sediments in order to conduct a proper and impartial scientific investigation? <laughs> Climate change. Sure, the environment, climate change. 
Oh, thank you, Speaker. You know, the ministry uh, takes concerns regarding groundwater quality very seriously, and we're holding the company accountable for addressing complaints related to changes, uh, if any, in well water quality. We have undertaken a review of water quality data to ensure residents uh, that their water is safe to drink, Speaker. And thus far, I will say the analysis has not shown a connection between water quality and construction activity. Uh, further, Speaker, the Chatham Kent Medical Officer of Health has confirmed he has confirmed, Speaker, the water particulates do not pose a health risk to residents. The ministry understands that the pile driving has now finished, and we're also planning to meet with, uh, with Water Answer. Wells first this week to discuss their data. We'll, uh, we're going to require, we're going to continue to require the company uh, continue to monitor its well Thank impacts you. and and. Uh, Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, these families have been the backbone of Ontario's agriculture sector for over generations and have built and fed this province from the land that they so proudly steward. And as the minister is aware, the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care is responsible for public health. Don't you think that public health authorities should know the substances that they are giving opinions on? This safety is affecting. Uh, this issue is affecting the viability of an entire region of this province. Without water, there will be nothing. Will you direct the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care to immediately order a health hazard investigation as the Health Prevention and Promotion Act provides for? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. I want to start by just reiterating what the Chatham-Kent Medical Officer of Health has told us through their testing and what our testing shows. What, but what, their, what, what, what that uh, Medical Officer of Health has said is that water particulates do not pose a health risk to residents. Speaker, We're going to be meeting with the group representing the homeowners. We understand they have some data we have asked them to share with us. We want to be able to talk to them about that data, Speaker, at our upcoming meeting with them. And we're going to continue to work with homeowners to, <clears throat> to supply alternative water. Uh, and we're also providing uh, the government, the company is providing a licensed well contractor to inspect their wells and answer any questions they may have. All of this at the company's expe uh, expense, Mr. Speaker. But I'll just end by saying the yes, medical sir. officer of health has said the water is safe. New question. A member from Kingston in the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Housing and the Minister responsible for the Poverty Reduction Strategy. While Ontario's economy is strong, we know that not every person in this province is feeling the benefits of that strength. Homelessness is a complex issue without a one-size-fits-all solution. Addressing homelessness requires input across and between governments to not simply house someone, but to help them build healthy and sustainable lives. It also requires that we work collaboratively with all stakeholders, and I'm again pleased to welcome partners who work in this field to our reception this evening on chronic homelessness. We also know that individuals who have access to stable housing Question. and wraparound supports have better health outcomes, both mental and physical. Could the minister please tell us about the investments that our province has made towards addressing homelessness Thank and you. its causes in Ontario? The member from Kingston and the Islands for the question and her advocacy on this issue. Our government knows that every person and family deserves the security of knowing they'll have a safe and adequate place to lay their heads at night. And that's why I'm committed to reaching our goal of ending chronic homelessness by 2025. Since 2013, we've invested nearly $1.2 billion through our Community Homelessness Prevention Initiative, helping communities across the province tackle homelessness through an integrated, people-centered, an outcome-focused uh, housing first approach. This funding is only going to grow in 2018, 2019, and 2020, Mr. Speaker. And we are already seeing the benefits of this approach. 
Uh, the CHPI has helped around 30,300 households experiencing homelessness obtain housing. And over 125,000 ho uh, homes that were in danger of losing their homes of preventing that outcome. Supplementary. Thank you to the minister for that answer, and thank you as well for your dedication in resolving chronic homelessness and poverty in our province. There are thousands of residents in my riding who benefit from the implementation of progressive provincial programs like rent control, increases to the minimum wage, free tuition, and OHIP+. Plus. Unfortunately, however, we are not immune from the pressures of the increased cost of living and a hot rental market. This year, the vacancy rate in Kingston and the Islands fell to 0.7 per cent. The minister spoke of some of the initiatives that we are working on earlier in question period, and we need to focus on building community resources and building connections between mental health services and developmental services. But, Question. Mr. Speaker, I I'm wondering if the minister could please tell this House more about what his ministry is doing to bring more housing, be it affordable, market price rental online. Minister. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the follow up. Uh, we're very serious about our goal to end chronic homelessness, Mr. Speaker. We've increased our funding for homelessness programs by 30 per cent, and that supports over 150,000 vulnerable families. Last March, we announced our Home for Good program, a homelessness-focused program which will invest up to $200 million in supportive housing and services to help up to 6,000 families and individuals access affordable and stable housing over the next three years. In 2017, the City of Kingston was able to expand and enhance the services provided to homeless youth uh, through the Kingston uh, Youth Shelter when we provided them with $70,000, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, everything we're doing is focused on providing more fairness and opportunity to the residents of Ontario. Yes, sir. Fairness in accessing good housing and affordable housing and creating more opportunity to have the kind of dignified life that all Ontarians deserve, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Huron Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Last week, the FAO reported that job growth has been uneven across the province's regions. In fact, it was reported that the, that the new job gains in 2017, there were only 1,600 net new jobs created in southwestern, eastern and northern Ontario combined. Speaker. That is a meager 1.2 per cent of the jobs created. Chief Clifford Bull of Lac Sol said he will, and I quote, Fight for better education and employment opportunities for our youth. You will. All of us will do that, Speaker. The FAO reported whole regions of the province being completely left behind. Ontario is just not Central Ontario and the GTHA. And it's your other first counties. It's Windsor, it's Thunder Bay, it's Leeds Grenville, and it's Kiwantanog. Of course, Thank Speaker, you. we want to hear from the Minister. What I stand, you sit. Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Thank you for that question. We take uh, economic development uh, seriously in Ontario. We take it particularly serious as it relates to Indigenous peoples in Ontario and particularly First Nations and Indigenous peoples in Northern Ontario. With that in mind, I can tell you that we have uh, something called the Indigenous Economic Development Fund. It's continuing for another seven years. It began in 2017-18. Uh, it's an additional investment of $70 million. That's a combined investment of $95 million over 10 years. Wow. We're going back to the 2014 budget, we introduced the Indigenous Economic Development Fund, and that was an investment of $25 million over three years. As a part of the fund, Ontario provided $15 million to an entity called Aboriginal Financial Institutions over Answer. three years. They provide grants and loans for promising Indigenous projects. Speaker, we take 
the development of economic life as it relates to our Indigenous peoples very, very seriously. It is a priority because that's how we're going to Again, when I stand, you sit. Point of order, member. Yep. Speaker, I want to uh, take the opportunity to uh, welcome Wendy Rosal here. Her uh, son Harrison is paged this week, so thank you. Welcome to the Queen's Park. Yeah. The time for question period is over. There are no deferred votes. Therefore, this house stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.